All right, y'all. There's my uh, Facebook audience, and uh, here's my Periscope audience. And uh, so, I want to thank you for coming on. Oh, my collar looks funny. <laughs> well, thank you for coming on tonight. Uh, this is my special uh, makeup show for No More Genies because uh, I was having some serious upload problems a couple weeks ago because I, I normally do it on the second Thursday of every month, but there were some issues, some uh, crazy internet stuff. So, I just decided to do it tonight. And so, thank all of you that are tuning in live. And thanks for all of you that end up watching this by replay. Okay? Uh, so let's jump on in. And I'll start with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. Just thank you for this time. Thanking you for your mighty word. Thanking you for the Savior. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Please speak to my mouth, God. I surrender my mouth, my tongue, my brain, my lips, my hands, my whole body. Speak to me, let God breathe to me, that you might be glorified and the saints might be edified and that what you want said might be said. And we thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. All right. So, what have I been talking about for these last two sessions? Last two sessions, I've been talking about saving my marriage. Okay? And so, I strongly, strongly encourage you to go back and listen to the two No More Genies uh, before this, because I was talking about some serious principles about marriage and a whole bunch of stuff about what it is and what it's not and how to avoid a lot of the traps and things that we get into, and a whole bunch of stuff. So today, like I told you, I always pray over these things. I'm never shooting from the hip. I'm never just making stuff up. Today I asked the Lord what did he want me to talk about in this session. And this session is going to be about hurdles we have to overcome. Okay? Hurdles we have to overcome uh, in marriage. The reason this is relevant for a No More Genie series is because if there's ever a place in our lives where we have a magic concept of God or a magic concept of something, it seems to be marriage. And I know why. It's because, at least in America, because I know how I have audience members from all over the world. But in, in America, what we do is we raise our children on the steady diet of fairy tales. When you raise your children on the steady diet of fairy tales, they can't help but ingest them and internalize them and then think that that's reality. And then they think that what they've seen on that fairy tale is what's going to happen in their marriage. And then, of course, what happens is real life kicks in. And when real life kicks in, it turns out to be nothing like what you thought it was going to be like. And then you're all upset, and then you're all angry, and then now you don't have the tools to deal with what you're actually dealing with in marriage. So it's really, really important that we look at the Word of God and what the Word of God actually says, because what God says is reality. The nature of reality is whatever God says. Whatever comes out of God's mouth, whatever God's word is, that's what makes something exist and that's what makes it so. So that's actually the place you're supposed to start if you want to deal with building a marriage, okay? Excuse me a minute. My mouth's really dry. i got to get some water. Hold on. Sorry about that. I have got terrible dry mouth now for some reason, so I've got to get some water. So excuse me for that little breaky break. Oh, much better. I must have had too much salt earlier because my mouth is oh, cottoning up. Okay, so we're going to start tonight with how do you design a spouse in the first place? Now, I'm actually going to end up writing a book on this topic because as I began to research this I found out there's a lot of stuff that happens just on the basis of discerning a spouse. When I say discerning a spouse I mean how do you figure out who it is you're supposed to marry? I found out that a lot of Christians don't know. They don't even know where to start. So you cannot possibly end up married to the right person if you don't start in the right place with the word of God. Okay? You use everything but the Word of God to make your decision, and that's not what we want to do. So how do we discern a spouse? Let's go to our first scripture, which is Genesis 2.18. Genesis 2.18, and I'm reading out of, I'm going to read a couple of different versions, but reading out of the NIV, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Uh... All of them pretty much the same thing. The English Standard Version. 
Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So just about every version of the Bible says that basic thing. It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. That's the NLT, New Living Translation. So right off the bat, you see that God's idea of picking a spouse is him custom designing someone to be for you. I will make a helper who is just right for him, fit for him, okay, suitable for him. So in other words, God custom designed Eve for Adam. So God's concept of marriage, God's concept of, of picking people is that he has to build somebody that's custom designed to be with you. So right off the bat, you can see why people get in so much trouble. <laughs> and that's because we end up connecting with people that aren't the people that God designed for us. They're not the people that God designed to be with us. And you ended up picking them based on lust or you want to have sex with them or you did have sex with them or you ended up having sex and you dropped a baby so you thought you ought to get married. Or you you know maybe one aspect of their life or maybe one dimension of your life. Like you guys are really good friends but you don't have any passion or you guys have a lot of passion but you're not really good friends or a whole bunch of different things and people end up getting married to people that are wrong for them. But instead of spending all our energy talking about how wrong that other person is or how wrong they are for you, I want to talk about how do you find the one that's right for you, okay? Well, that's found in the scriptures too, but not where you might think. The answer to that question is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Let's read that. Matthew's first book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, okay? So we're going to start with Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 through 17. I baptize you, that's John the Baptist talking, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, by you, and do you come to me? Jesus rep replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now that is the baptism of Christ. That's Jesus going to the Jordan River, getting baptized by his first cousin, John the Baptist. And basically, it's the Lord's coronation. Basically, it's the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So what does all of that have to do with discerning a spouse? I'll tell you. If Jesus needed a threefold witness <laughs> to be identified, what in the world makes you think you can identify a spouse without it? Jesus needed a threefold witness to, to be identified as the Messiah. He had the witness of the Father, he had the witness of the Spirit, and he had the witness of man. It's threefold witness. First witness. Jesus had the witness of John the Baptist. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than me, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John the Baptist gave witness that Jesus was actually the Messiah. That's witness number one. Okay? As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. So witness number two was the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, in the form of a dove, or like a dove, descended on Jesus and alighted on him. Okay? Witness number three, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So Father actually spoke from heaven. So when Jesus was coming up out of the Jordan River, Father God in heaven actually parted heaven, let the Holy Spirit descend, and then Father himself spoke and said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him while I am well pleased. 
What does that tell you? Jesus got a threefold witness before he started his ministry, okay, to identify who he was. If you couldn't look at God in the flesh and tell that that was God, if you couldn't look at Jesus and tell who he was, but rather you needed a threefold witness to discern who he was, and what in the world makes you think you can look at someone and discern whether or not they should be your spouse? You need a threefold witness. You need the same witness that Jesus had. First, the Lord needs to speak to you from, now I'm not talking about order now. The Lord needs to speak to you from heaven. The Lord needs to speak to you from heaven and say, this is the one I've chosen for you to marry. Number two, the Holy Ghost needs to light on the relationship and stay. If you're fighting all the time and arguing all the time and you don't have no peace, they ain't the one. Because the Holy Ghost will light on that relationship and stay if it's the relationship that God has for you. And then you'll get the witness from man. What does the witness from man look like? It means you can bring your potential spouse around your family, around your mother, around your father, around your siblings, around your best friends, around the people that know you the most and love you the best. Around the people that know you the best and love you the most. If you can't bring your potential spouse around those people, then they not the one. See that? So you ought to be able to see how a lot of people, uh, right off the bat, are married to the wrong person. How you know, even when you're dating, that they're not right? I'll tell you how you know. Because you have to sneak. <laughs> if you're with anybody, you've got to sneak around to be with, they ain't the one. Okay? Whatever it is about them or the situation or the circumstances or you or whatever, that makes you believe that you have to sneak around to be with them. They are not the one. Because the right one you can bring out here in the light and test it in the light of what I just taught you about a threefold witness. The Lord will speak to you. The Spirit of God will manifest and light on that relationship. And there will be witnesses from the people around you that know you the best and love you the most. And if they can't pass that test, they ain't the one. Okay? So now you ought to be able to see just on that alone how we discern a spouse in the kingdom of God. And I discovered a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know what I just said. That's why I'm going to end up writing a book on it. Because that's why a lot of people, you know, don't you know those couples where one of them come to church to the point where you didn't even know sister so-and-so was married or you didn't even know brother so-and-so was married because you never have seen their spouse. Because they, <laughs> they always come to church by themselves. Okay? Why you always come to church by yourself if you got the right one? How come your partner, you know, doesn't enjoy the worship of God, you know, doesn't love the Lord, doesn't want to be around the saints and all that? See? That's why you need to get a witness before you get married. But many times that's not how we do it. We think because they got a good job or we think because they look good or we think because we crave their body or we think because they have money or we think because they come from a good family. We think a whole bunch of things. A whole bunch of things that is not what the Bible says. I just told you what the Bible said. That's how Jesus had to be identified. That means that when God turns himself into a man, you couldn't discern who he was just with your natural eye. That means if you couldn't look at God and tell that was him, what in the world makes you think you can look at another human being and tell you're supposed to be married to him? You need that threefold witness. So if people did that, that would save them a lot of problems if you use the threefold witness technique in discerning a spouse. Okay? So let's move on. Let's look at some other hurdles to overcome. Next hurdle to overcome is age. Now, what do I mean by age? Uh, I mean stage of life, and I mean age difference. So let's talk about let's talk about advantages versus disadvantage. Disadvantages. So what's some of the advantages of getting married when you're really young? Well, if you get married when you're really young, like let's say 19, and you live to be like 85, 90 years old, you have spent the vast majority of your years married. That means at a very young age, you got to begin to learn how to adjust to married life, and you brought all your energy, all your beauty, all your best fertility, especially for women at younger ages. Some of the disadvantages, though, is you're going to have to turn away some other things that you would have been doing during that time in your life. Not that you can't do them, but you can't do everything you might have done if you weren't married. And see, nowadays, Americans have a problem with what we call opportunity costs. Opportunity cost is, 
you have path A and path B. If you choose path A, you have to forgive, forever give up everything that was on path B. If you choose path B, you have to forgive, forever give up everything that was on path A. Because you can't have both of them. So whenever you make a choice in life, there's something called an opportunity cost. You're, the cost you're paying to pursue what you're pursuing is giving up something else you could be doing. And so when you get married really, really young, then some of the other things you could have been doing when you were young and building your marriage, you're going to have to give those up, or at least some of them. You don't have to give all of them up. And you might have to modify them because now you have to do them as a couple. Okay? Let's look at post-youth. You get married after 30. Some people are a lot more stable after the age of 30. Some people think they're a lot more ready to be married after the age of 30. But if you get married after your youth, after 30, you're bringing some baggage with you. Everything from your teenage years and your 20 years, 20s, you bring it into that relationship with you. And so many times, people may or may not want to deal with that, and people may or may not want to be bothered with you if you are bringing all that into your marriage after the age of 30. And then sometimes, some people live really hard when they're young. So by the time they get in their 30s, their looks have already started to turn because they've been abusing their body for years. And if you've been abusing your body for years, you're asking someone to marry that abused body as opposed to if you got married earlier. Okay? But uh, some advantages is that you get all those young years to do whatever you want because you don't have the responsibilities of a family. So all your teens and all your 20s, you can travel the world, do whatever you want. Okay? What if you get married in middle age, 45 to 60? Well, if you get married in middle age, then a friend of mine told me once, you don't make it to 50 without baggage. So not only do you have magic ba uh, baggage, you have major baggage by the time you get to the 45 to 60 range. Some women have already gone through the change, so you can't have kids. So whatever kids you were going to have, if you haven't had them by then, if you're a woman, then it might be game over for you. And a man may or may not uh, you know, want to marry a woman, can't give him kids. You have to start dealing with issues that come along with that uh, stage of life, depending on how well you're taking care of yourself. And then sometimes... Your heart might be a little shut down. It might be a little battered. It might be a little bruised. It might be a little weary over all that you've been through if you get married in what we call midlife. But if you get married in the senior range, 65 and up, 65 and up, well, by the time you're 65 years old and up, you ought to have a little bit more sense than you did when you were 25. I hope you didn't just spend them 40 years, didn't learn nothing. So hopefully you have the wisdom of years and the wisdom of of age and experience on your side, but if you get married over 65, you might not have the energy. Uh, if you're a woman, your baby making years are most likely over. You know, never say never, but chances are, you know, you're not going to get pregnant. You might not have the energy you once did as, as a man. You might, because some people do, but you might not. You might be ending the end of your career. You might have 30 more years to live. If you retire at 65, you could die at 95. You might have 30 more years to live. What are you going to do with them 30 years? Okay, and do you have the money? Uh, I'll get to that later. You know, because you have to ask questions like that. You don't have to ask questions like that when you're 20 because all your working years are still in front of you. But you may have to ask. I mean, you definitely have to ask those questions when you get married 65 and up. Okay. So we've looked at the advantages and the disadvantages of getting married at different stages. So now let's look at what the Bible says. What does God endorse? What does God recommend? Okay, we're going to start with Proverbs 5.18. Proverbs 5.18. Okay. Now Proverbs, as you know, is right in the middle of the Bible. Proverbs, all of the Proverbs were not written by King Solomon. There were some other writers of Proverbs, but King Solomon wrote the majority of Proverbs. And Proverbs are basically wise sayings that give us teachings about life. They're short, encapsulated sayings. They're not long, drawn-out letters like the Pauline epistles, where Paul is talking about the Christian life in a whole lot of long language. But they're short, encapsulated little, little nuggets of wisdom that Solomon would drop to give us principles and ideas about living. So in Proverbs chapter 5, verse, verse 18, it says, coming out of the NIV, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Uh, New American Standard Bible. Let your fountain be blessed, and rejoice in the wife of your youth. Uh, King James. Let, the, let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. So I'm starting to see, hear a pattern here. 
Let's look to our next, uh, next scripture, which is Malachi 2.14. You ask why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. So God endorses getting married when you're young. Do you know why that's better? Because, number one, it's easier to avoid fornication if you know you have a marriage bed waiting for you in your young years. A lot of people give in to sexual sin because they don't have any hope in front of them. So when you go through the change as a teenager and your body gets shot full of hormones and you're on fire morning, noon, and night, you need to know that not too many years from now I'm going to be able to get married. That gives you a focus. That gives you a hope. It's like graduating. You know I'll be able to move on to the next stage. So you can then prepare. Prepare for marriage, and that's what will help you not live a life of fornication because you'll learn some self-control. You'll, you'll get ready to build your marriage. And then you get married, you can have all the sex you want, which is blessed and honorable in the eyes of God. If you don't do that, you are most likely going to live a life of fornication, adultery, and pornography. And none of that is pleasing in the eyes of God. It's not pleasing in the eyes of God for us to watch porn. I know that porn has become ubiquitous. I know porn is everywhere. I know half the people that come to church got porn on their phone. I know it's everywhere, but that doesn't make it right in the eyes of God. Okay, because the Bible says I will set no wicked thing in my eyes. And pornography is a wicked thing. Teaching you to not honor the sanctity of marriage, but to do all kind of crazy stuff outside of marriage, like we're a bunch of animals. That's not pleasing in the eyes of God, number one. Number two, adultery is not pleasing in the eyes of God. Because the Bible says that marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So if you are married, but you're tipping on your wife, or if you're a woman and you're married, but you're tipping on your husband, or if you're a single person, but you only date married people, any of that, or swinging, the Bible talks about swinging, about don't let some, somebody come into your wife and don't go into another man's wife, that kind of lifestyle, that kind of stuff is not pleasing in the eyes of God. And if you don't get married when you're young and establish your family, there's a greater and greater temptation as you go through your teens, 20s, and 30s to want to get into all that. And fornication is any kind of sexual immorality that exists outside of marriage. None of that stuff is pleasing to God. And people do it. And a lot of people do it. And people in the Bible did it. But they pay for it. That's the part many times that people don't tell you. That some of the, the sins and the things you see in the Bible, people pay dearly for those mistakes. Samson paid for getting involved with Delilah, the wrong woman, with his life. Samson ended his life and his ministry early because he got involved with Delilah, got out of the will of God, the anointing lifted off him, and all his super strength left. So then when the Philistines came to get him, he had no power to fight back. And all that was because he was involved with Delilah. So sometimes if you get involved with the wrong person, it's going to end your life early. Uh, King David went into Bathsheba. Bathsheba was Uriah's wife. She was bathing on the rooftop one night, naked. David saw her. He said, who is that? His friends told him. He said, go get her. He slept with her. He got her pregnant. Then he tried to bring Uriah back in off the field to sleep with her to make it look like it was Uriah's baby. But Uriah wouldn't sleep with his wife because he was honorable. He said, I'm not going to be at home having pleasure with my life when my brother and are on the battlefield. So then David had Uriah killed. They had the funeral. He moved Bathsheba to the palace. She had that baby they conceived, and they was finna step on like nothing ever happened. And God said, oh, no, 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 no. And God sent Nathan to talk to David, and God pronounced all the judgments in David's life. Uh, the baby was going to die. He was going to have war for the rest of his life. He was going to have trouble raised up out of his own house, and his dear. he did because David's kids went crazy. Absalom rebelled against David and tried to kick him off the throne, and David had to run from his life from his own son. His son Amnon raped his sister Tamar, okay? Incest rape inside of David's own kids. So a whole lot of stuff happened in David's life because he hooked up with Bathsheba, because he took another man's wife, got her pregnant, and had the husband killed. So David had to deal with that trouble for the rest of his life, okay? It wasn't worth it. And the same thing happens if you live in adultery now. If you live in adultery now, God's going to judge you and you are going to, oh, it won't be worth it. 
By the time you end up going through everything you have to go through as a result of the penalty for your adultery, you will wish you never met that person. Because you will eventually realize that the pleasure of that side piece, that jump off relationship, isn't worth the price you're going to have to pay. So that's another reason why God is an advocate of youthful marriage. It's better to go ahead on and get married when you're young, still young, still beautiful, still got all the years ahead of you, still easy uh, to conceive children. And here's the big one. You haven't had a chance to create a past. I'm going to talk about that more later. Okay? But you do have to give up some things to get married young. You have to give up your freedom because you're no longer free to come and go as you please. But that doesn't mean you still can't accomplish some of the things you want to accomplish. You just have to do it as a couple. But there is going to be an opportunity cost. But the Bible is an advocate advocate for early marriage, young marriage, so that when you're a young person, now I'm not talking about child brides, don't, don't go all crazy. I'm not talking about that stuff they do in the Middle East where you've got grown men marrying nine-year-olds. That ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people of legal age, okay? People that are legally adults that have come of age, I'm talking about getting married young, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22. A lot of people say that's much too young, you're still a kid, but that's not what God says because Jesus' mama was younger than that when she got betrothed to Joseph, okay? King Josiah was eight years old when he was on the throne. Solomon was a king when he was young. So, but anyway, you know, that's cultural difference. And so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm talking about, you know, our American standards of young adults, grown people. Okay, I'm not talking about anything other than that. But I'm saying once you do become an adult when you're still young, the Bible says to go ahead and establish your married life then. You do have to give up some opportunity costs, yes. But that's better than a life of fornication or adultery or pornography. Because it wears your body out, it wears your mind out, it wears your reputation out. And then you have all that baggage when you finally decide to get married to someone that you're asking somebody else to live with. you got a head full of memories you're never going to fully shake. I mean, you might have some STDs. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that happens when you live that kind of life. Okay? So number one, uh, our subject tonight is we're talking about hurdles to overcome. Save my marriage part three. So the first hurdle we talked about was how do you discern a spouse in the first place? How do you figure out who am I supposed to marry? Second one is age. Okay, I've talked about stage of life. Now I'm going to talk about age difference. If you marry someone that is of a different age difference than you, if it's a significant difference, if it's give or take five years, y'all are of the same generation. If it's give or take 20 years, y'all are of a different generation. So if you're 20 and your spouse is 25, same generation. If you're 25 and your spouse is 30, same generation. Y'all were just missing each other being in high school by one year. So you're the same generation. But if you're 20 and your spouse is 40, or if you're 30 and your spouse is 50, y'all from different generations. You got different music, you got different food, you got different thought patterns. I mean, people my age, remember, did not have social media. Social media is a result of the 21st century. Okay, the internet started rising to power in the 90s. Remember AOL and blah, 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 you've got mail and all that. That started in the 90s. Social media is only like 10, 12 years old at best. It's not that old, but it is everywhere. And it is becoming ingrained in the fabric of our lives, at least for now. Okay, so if you're dealing with someone that was born in the 21st century, they're 19 years old this year. So a life of social media and putting all your business out there is pretty much the only life that they know. If you were born before the year 2000, the further back you go, the more you remember a time where social media was not everywhere in America. Y'all are from a different generation. You got different music. You got different lifestyle patterns. Uh, a younger generation now, I was just reading an article the other day about how a young man was kicking the 71-year-old woman. Might have been his grandma, but it was, there was this video where this young man was on the train and he was kicking this elderly woman. And I don't know what it was for, but in my day, that would have been unthinkable. Wasn't nobody young going around kicking old people? I mean, literally stuff like that did not occur to our heads. The only people that did stuff like that back then, when I was a kid, were super crazy people. Super, super, super crazy people because I was raised at a, at a time in a generation where you respected folks that were older than you, even if you didn't like them, even if you weren't related to them. Just based on the fact that they were older than you, you had to respect them. But it's not like that now. 
So if you marry out of your generation, they're not going to have your same values, especially now. Okay? They're not going to have the same values you do because they've come up in a different time. Because anybody born late 90s or after the year 2000 has come up in a time where they put all their business on social media, where they have bought into the, the idea of no privacy. I mean, we got people posting pictures on Facebook of babies that are literally literally about five seconds old. <laughs> like they just came out to mama. <laughs> they put their picture on Facebook. And, that, you know, so, you know, people in my generation don't know nothing about that because we, do, we didn't have social media. Okay? And so it's just a different kind of thing. So I'm saying all that to say that if you marry, if there's a 20-year difference or more, y'all from different generations, five years, same generation, 20 years, different generation. So you have to take that into account because you're not going to see life the same way. Every time you have a zero birthday, your mind changes. When you're 10 years old, well, when 10 years old, that's your first zero birthday. I was going to say when you're zero, but you're still in your mother's womb. When you're 10 years old, one zero, that's your first zero birthday. Think about how you thought when you were a kid, when you were 10. 10 years later, by the time you're 20, you are somebody completely different. By the time you turn 30, your next zero birthday, you're so different from where you were when you were 20. You can't believe you were ever in your 20s. By the time you turn 40, you have changed so much. After seeing four decades of life, you won't believe some of the things you thought in your earlier years. By the time you turn 50, 60, 70, every time you have a zero birthday, your mind changes. Okay? So you have to take that into account when you're thinking about who you're trying to marry. Because if they've had, the more zero birthdays you have, the more your mind has changed. Okay? So, okay, so that's age. So we talked about, number one, discerning spouse. Number two, we talked about age, which includes stage of life and age of difference. We talked about advantages and disadvantages of where you are when you get married. And then we talked about what the Bible actually says, and the Bible is an advocate of early marriage, young marriage. Um, again, I'm talking about young adults, people of legal age. That's what I'm talking about. So don't get what I'm saying twisted. I'm talking about grown folks. Okay? All right. Let's move on to talk about the third hurdle we have to overcome. And the third hurdle we have to overcome is communication. And communication is really a reflection of character. What do I mean by that? Because people always talk about, you need to learn how to communicate with your spouse. Well, let's break that down a little bit. People do not communicate in words. People communicate in pictures. When you think of something, when you hear words, you don't form words in your mind. You form, you form pictures. So people tend to think in pictures. And when we talk about communication, the truth about communication is that you have a picture in your head. You haven't communicated until the person that you're talking to has the same picture in their head that you have in your head. And so many times that's why people's communication skills are poor because they don't really know what communication is. You have a picture. You have a picture of what you want your marriage to be like, what you don't want it to be like, what your wedding day is going to be like, a whole bunch of different things. You have a picture in your head. And many times what people do is they just assume. You just assume that a potential partner's picture is the same as yours. And no, it's not. You have to communicate, which leads me to the second part of what I said, is that it's a reflection of character. It's a reflection of honesty. What do I mean by that? I mean that a lot of people aren't really going to tell you their real picture. They're going to give you a fake picture in order to get you to marry them, and then the real picture is going to come out later, and that is called a bait and switch. And I can't tell you how many people have gotten married based on a bait and switch. You met somebody, you like them, and they acted a certain way to give you an impression that that's who they really were, and then you marry them. And once you marry them, a whole different person came out. That's called a bait and switch. They gave you a picture to make you think a certain thing. And then after you got married, then the real them came out. That's illegal in advertising. You actually can't do that in the business world, in the marketplace. Like you can't put on your website lawnmowers for $99. And then everybody runs to your store and say, we saw on your website you're selling those high-quality lawnmowers 
for 99 bucks. And then when the people get in the store, you say, well, I forgot to tell you, I actually meant $999. They're $1,000, not You can't do that. You can't advertise one price to get people in the store and then charge them another once you get them there. That's, you can't, that's illegal. That's false advertising. You can't do that in business. But people do it in marriage all the time. People are doing it in marriage all the time, and God is going to make you answer for that treachery. You can't, do, you can't give people the impression that life is going to be a certain way with you just to get them to marry you and then flip that once you get married. You, you took vows before God, and they only married you based on that picture that you gave them. You can't do that. That's not against the law in America, but it is against God's law. Because you are a false witness. You sat up there and you gave testimony about yourself that wasn't true. And you sat up there and you took vows before God that you knew you had no intention of keeping. You are a false witness. And God's going to answer you because God said not to bear false witness against thy neighbor. But God also said he's a swift witness against perjurers. God had said that he himself is a swift witness against people that lie under oath. And when you get married, you are taking vows. Vows before God, I do, I will, I take. I take, I do, I will. I take, I will, I do. And then you get home and you say, I don't. You're a liar. And God himself is going to answer you. So that's why it's better from the jump. <laughs> if you know you have no intention of keeping your marriage vows, don't make them. Okay? It's better from the jump to be honest when people meet you so they can make a fully informed choice as to what they're getting. And the more baggage you have, the harder that is to do, which is, again, why it's better to get married when you're young before you create a past. That's another reason God says that's the best way to go. You've been alive 19 years. You may or may not have a past. You've been alive 59 years. <laughs> Pretty safe to say you got a pass, some kind of pass, okay? Unless you've been celibate for 59 years, for which I congratulate you, but most people aren't going to do that, okay? So that leads me to the next point under communication, which is the vetting process. How exactly do you vet someone? If you don't know what that word means, it means checking someone out to see if there's a match there and to see if you want to marry them. Now, some people use a vehicle called courtship. Courtship is uh, dating with a purpose, and what that means is that you're dating to marry. You're dating to see if there's a match there, okay? And courtship is different from the worldly concept of dating, which is we're just going to fornicate for a while till we get tired of each other, then we're going to move on to somebody else. That's different, okay? Some people use courtship. Some people don't use courtship. Some people like the idea. Some people don't. But the point is to vet the person. Okay, and there are four basic things you have to do when you're vetting someone, and here they are. Under the vetting, for, vetting process, the first thing you have to do is you have to show them who it is that you are. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What makes me laugh? What makes me angry? How do I spend my time? Who, what kind of personality do I have? Am I extroverted? Do I get my energy from being around people, or am I introverted? Do I like to be alone? Am I like a travel bunny, like every other weekend I'm flying to another city? Or am I a homebody? My idea of having a good time is curling up in front of the fireplace, putting on a nice movie, making some popcorn. Who am I? Okay? And there's no right or wrong there. Okay? It's just whoever it is that you are. You might be really talkative. You might be really quiet. You might be a person who doesn't really live a lot by their emotions. Some people are very, very strong on living on their principles, and they don't you know, really care that much about how they feel. Some people are the total flip of that. They're passionate, and they live their life out of their souls, man. And they give it 100%, but that also means when they're empty, they're empty. It also means sometimes they're like this. Really emotional people are like this. They had them really high days where they had a lot of fun to be around, and they had them crash days. Okay? So there's no right or wrong there. Don't misunderstand me. There is no right or wrong there's just who you are. But the question is, is that who you're showing to your potential spouse? Like I just used myself for an example. 
I'm a creative person. I'm creative all, all the time. My antenna is up all the time, even when I'm sleeping. Like I'm doing other things and songs are coming to me, so I have to stop and write them down. That's just the way I live. I have a piano by my bed. I kid you not. I have a piano in my bedroom by my bed that all I have to do is get up and sit down by the piano if I need to. Okay? Because that's just me. I'm a creative type. Okay? That is who I am. I'm not the type of dude that gets up and goes to work at like 8 o'clock and then punches out at 5 o'clock and comes home and eats the same dinner every night and is in bed by 9.30. That ain't me. That ain't my life. Okay? My life works much, much more seasonally. I have things I want to accomplish by a certain time. And so my time is kind of spent around accomplishing those goals, not punching a clock day by day. You see what I mean? That's just me. So when you meet me, that's who you're going to meet. Because I'm not trying to hide me being that way. Because that's who I am. That's what I mean. So when you meet them, do you have the courage to let them know who it is that you are and who it is that you aren't? So number one, who are you? But number two, where is it that you're going? Super important. <laughs> okay? That's super important. Five years from now, where do you see yourself? Do you have a plan? Are you the kind of person that just kind of lives day by day, situation to situation? Are you reactive to life or are you proactive? Are you the kind of person that has set a sail, has a plan that you've uh, gone, gone before the Lord and asked God to direct your steps? But five years from now, I plan to be here. Okay? Is that how you think? Is that how your life is structured or not? Okay? So where is it that you're going? Are you the kind of person that's just sitting around waiting to get married? There's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people that are just working a job or going to school, but what they really want is a relationship, and they are literally just sitting around waiting to get married. If that's who you are, then tell them that. That I really don't really have any plans other than trying to find a spouse and get married. Because if you don't do that, whatever your plan is, it's going to come out later. If you want to go to school, you need to tell them that while you're dating. That I love you, but I really want to finish my degree. So maybe I should finish my degree first and then we get married. Or if we get married now, then we're going to have to build some time into those early years for me to finish my education because I really want to graduate. You see what I mean? Where are you going? And if you haven't thought about it, you need to think about it before you get married. Okay? So number one, who is it that you are? Number two, where are you going? Number three, what is it that you want out of the marriage? That's huge. Because I don't care what anybody says, when you go into a marriage, you go into a marriage with expectations. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I don't care what anybody says. As soon as somebody says, we're boyfriend and girlfriend, or we're engaged, or this is my fiance, or we're getting married, all them expectations come flooding up to the front. And when you actually get married, they come bursting out like bursting through a dam. And all the things that you wanted to happen in your marriage are going to be right there. So it's better if you admitted all that from the jump. Like, uh, you know, talk about your sexual expectations. Like, you know, I want to have sex every day. Or I'm just kind of a, a twice a week person. Or if you're a virgin and you don't know, tell your spouse, I'm a virgin, I'm sexually pure. I haven't done anything with anybody, so I really don't know myself sexually. So I will be learning and exploring with you as we go through our marriage. Tell them, okay? If you're the kind of person where, you know what? In my family, every night we had dinner together. So mom and daddy didn't care too much about breakfast. But they made sure that every night we ate dinner together as a family. If that's how you grew up and that's what you expect your marriage to be like, tell them that. Okay? What are your expectations? Tell them, if you grew up without a TV, tell them, you know, I'm not that much of a TV watcher. You know, we did other things. Or if you want one of them people that did, you just stay on the TV. You got to tell people that. Because you do expect your married life to go a certain way. Like a lot of people, for example, here's a big one. Let me take this drink. A lot of people, especially people that come from close families, expect their spouses to support them in everything that they do. And you're going to find out after you get married that there's some things your spouse is not going to want to support you in. They may do it anyway, or they may just be like, yeah, you know what? That's going to be a big deal. Because some people expect their spouse to be there for everything, and some people don't. But whatever your expectation is, it's very real to you. 
So you think it's going to be real to them. Okay? All right. And number four is what do you have to offer in return? That's very, very important. Because you spend all that time talking about what you want. Okay? What is it that you're bringing to the table? <laughs> okay? What are you bringing to the, to the table? All that, what you're talking about, I want this and I want this and I want that. And I want my married life to be like this. What are you bringing? So let's listen to what God has to say. Let's look at a scripture. The scripture we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Very familiar scripture. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Pretty self-explanatory. Why is that important? Because many times... We're not telling our spouses the truth, and then we have a fight, or then we have a falling out, or then we have an affair, or then somebody gets violent, or somebody storms out the room, or somebody moves out the house, or somebody does something extreme. And then when you come back together, you find out the only way to work through your issue is you have to tell the truth. If you told the truth from the jump, maybe you could have avoided all that ugliness in the middle, but it's hard. Don't, I, don't misunderstand me. I understand what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is easier said than done because all this stuff is simple in concept, difficult in execution. It's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes to tell your spouse, you know, baby, my mother cooked fresh for us like every day. So I don't really like this going out to eat so much. I don't really like this going out to eat, you know, like uh, all the time or just having a fresh meal once a week because my mom cooked for us every day. What if your spouse looks at, you and says, looks at you and says, well, I ain't doing all that. <laughs> then what? <laughs> what if you expected to have five to six fresh meals a week and now you maybe might get one? And everything else is going to be leftovers or microwave dinners or eating out. What are you going to do then? That's not what you expected. See what I mean? Better to talk about that stuff before you get married. Because if somebody looks at you and says, well, I ain't cooking every day then you know. See what I mean? That's very important. One of my uh, relatives took his family out to eat uh, at least once a week for as long as I can remember. They had like a, a restaurant night, like Tuesday night or Friday night. They would go out to eat. Now, I'm talking about fancy restaurants too. They would go out to eat at least once a night on the regular. That was just part of, part of their thing. I grew up with a gourmet chef, so... The woman that raised me knew how to cook, man. She could put her foot in every dish that she made. So she made fresh food all the time. So we didn't really go out that much because we didn't have to. Because I had a gourmet chef right in the house. And I know how to cook, too. So I like both. I like cooking. I like going out. I can deal with all that. But some people don't know how to cook. Some people don't want to cook. Some people just like the restaurant hop. So whatever it is that your expect, expectation is, you should have told the truth. You shouldn't have married someone with the expectation of they thought they was going to get fresh meals every day, and that ain't you should have told them the truth. Because the Bible says that love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love rejoices in the truth. Okay? Uh, let's move on. So first hurdle to overcome is discerning a spouse. Second hurdle is age. Next hurdle was communication. Next one, we're going to talk about finances, okay? Every aspect of your marriage is affected by your finances. Or as my father used to say, romance without finance is a nuisance. <laughs> it's a nuisance if you get married, you ain't got no money, y'all going to have some issues, okay? So you got to talk about money. Well, what do you have to talk about with money? Well, first of all, you have to talk about, number one, you have to talk about how money is generated. How are we going to make our money? There's more than one way to make money. Some people think there's only one way to make money. There's more than one way to make money. Some people only think about earned income. That's called having a job, punching the clock. You can make money on passive income. You can have investments that are making money for you and sending you a check every month where that money's working for you. Okay? You can have residual income, which is a form of passive income, meaning you did work one time, but you're still getting checks for it. Like TV commercials are like actors when they're on a major a TV show, when that show stops being in production, but they still air the episode, somebody's getting a check from that. That's residuals. Same with movies. Okay? So it's not just earned income. That's not the only way to make money. Okay? But you do need to talk about it because it has everything to do with how you think. 
Okay? And then you have to, number two, talk about how money is managed. How are you going to manage your money? Not just how you're going to generate it, but how you're going to manage it. Some people have a budget. Some people don't. Some people have seat of day pants. <laughs> money management. Some people don't worry about it. They just write checks and check the balance later or never. I mean, that's going to affect your day-to-day -day living, man. If you, if you are controlling the checkbook and you sit down to pay the bills only to discover some of them checks is bouncing or some of them credit card transactions are declined because you don't have as much money in the house account as you thought because your spouse took out $200 at the ATM and didn't bother to tell you, that's going to be an issue. Okay? Number three, what is your level of lifestyle? Uh, hold on a second. I have to get some more water. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. But my throat's still really dry. i got to get some water. Hold on. Didn't have any water, so I must have some in the basement, but okay. So anyway, all right, so back. So I had to take a little water break. So, all right, so we talked about generating money. We talked about managing money. Now we have to talk about level of lifestyle. What is level of lifestyle? What I mean by that is how do you want to live? Very important. Do you want to live a $40,000 lifestyle? Do you want to live a $100,000 lifestyle? Do you want to live a quarter of a million dollar lifestyle? Do you even know what that is? Do you want to live a million dollar lifestyle? Do you understand the tax bracket at that level? How much money do you owe the government? How much money do you get to keep? A uh, whole bunch of different things you got to deal with, okay, that's going to affect your day-to-day -day living. One of the most famous stories, of course, is MC Hammer way back in the 80s. Some of y'all might not know who that is. But MC Hammer got a $14 million advance after uh, Can't Touch This. When Can't Touch This came out, that blew up. That record was everywhere. So for his next record, for a Too Legit, he got $14 million in advance. $14 million in advance on a record contract. You owe $7 million to the government. So it's not really $14 million. It's $7 million. He bought a house that was like $10 million. <laughs> so that means he was already in debt. As soon as he got that $14 million advance, he should have taken his $7 million out off the top to pay his taxes, which would have told him he only had $7 million left. But he didn't know that, so he bought a $10 million house already in the hole. See what I mean? That's what I mean about saying if you know a level of lifestyle that you want to live on, you need to understand what that means and how that works. And y'all need to talk about that, hopefully, before you get married. Because it's going to come up in the marriage. Don't think you're going to get away from it. Just like having a lot of student loan debt. Do you have a lot of student loan debt? Do you have a plan on paying that back? Very important. Okay, and next we need to talk about stage of life plans. What do I mean by that? I mean by that you want to have kids. How many kids do you want to have? When do you want to have them? Because being a parent from 20 to 40 is different from being a parent from 40 to 60. Okay, it's different. Or being a parent from 30 to 50 is different from being a parent from 50 to 70. Because raising a child costs half a million dollars and at least 20 to 25 years per child. <laughs> That's right. Every child you had, especially if you get them through college, it's going to cost you half a million dollars to raise that and educate that child. And it's going to take you 20 years to take that child from a little baby to a fully functioning adult. 20 to 25 years per child. So if you want to do that, best to get to that started when you're young. Best try to be a parent between 20 to 40. Because by the time that last baby gets up, you'll still have plenty of life left. If you're a parent, however, from like 30 to 50 or 50 to 70, that's different. Very, very different if you dropped your last baby at 50. Because you're going to be 70 by the time that child gets grown. Different stage of life. See that? 
A lot of married couples don't think about that because they don't understand that that's going to happen in your marriage. A lot of married couples think it's always going to be like it is now. That's not true. Okay? So it's good that you think about stage of life plans because they're going to take money. Whatever it is you're trying to do, education, higher education, buying homes, moving, selling homes, living in condos. Uh, you might want to do something called homesteading where you buy a lot of acreage and you grow your own food and you raise your own livestock. Nothing wrong with that. You can your own preserves. You have a water pump well on, am I married? No. You have a water pump well on uh, your property, um, all that different kind of stuff. You have to talk about that. You got to think about that before you get married because it's going to take money and it's going to be a lifestyle and, and you don't want to be running into those challenges unprepared. Another big one is insurance. God forbid, God forbid we don't want anything to happen, but God forbid, what if uh, you die early? What if you or your spouse die early? Do you have insurance in place? Have you talked about that? Because I personally know, personally I know a couple of women that were widowed very early. I mean, like in their 30s. One, a woman and her husband had cancer, aggressive form of cancer. And one woman and her husband died of a heart attack, I think maybe 40s or so. And then women found themselves widows at very early ages. Don't nobody expect to be no widow at no 38 have you ever thought about that? you ever talked about that? What if it's the other way around? What if you lose your wife and you're still a very young man? What would you do? What would you do if you had a house full of kids and mama's gone? I know that those are morbid conversations, but you have to have them. Because there's a possibility of things being that way, and you need to have some type of money plans in place. Now, let's look at the scripture. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes 10 and 19. Ecclesiastes is right in the middle of the Bible. And it's basically King Solomon stepping back and taking a long look at life and writing down what he saw. Ecclesiastes 10.19 says, A feast is made for laughter, and wine, making, wine maketh life merry, but money answereth everything. A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Okay. I don't know how much more plain Solomon could have made that. <laughs> he said money answers all things. If it's a thing, money will answer it. Now, that doesn't mean money answers everything or else the Bible would have said that. Some things are not a thing, like love. Love is not a thing. Love is a spiritual force. Faith, faith is not a thing. Faith is a spiritual force. force. That's why you can't buy faith with money because it's not a thing. You most certainly cannot buy love with money because it's not a thing. Okay? But if it's a thing... The Bible says money will answer it. Anything that's a thing, money will most definitely answer it. You see that? So you have to have those kinds of conversations with your spouse, man. And it's better if you have those conversations from the jump, if you know uh, what's going on. Okay? So uh, let's look at one last one, and I'll be ready to wrap up. Let's look at career versus marriage. Now, career versus marriage is a big conversation for, for just about every kind of marital situation because you look at you know what you want to do for a living and pursuing that to its fullest potential and then you look at uh being married so let's look at what the bible says because again many times people argue about a right and wrong here but i would say let's study scripture and then let's take it before the lord and get some direction from what the lord has to say so let's look at first corinthians seven thirty two. Now, as you know, as you've heard me say many times, the Pauline epistles are Paul writing letters to churches to answer the questions that um, uh, they asked him. So there was a church at Corinth, and they asked Paul a lot of questions because they were new Christians, and they just uh, had converted to Christianity, so they didn't know how to live now under this new system. So that's what First and Second Corinthians are. Paul answering the letters to the, the new Christians at the church in Corinth, okay? All right. I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. Uh, we're going to read 32 and 33. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cared for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay? 
So what does that say? Okay, that's very, very plain. Let me read verse 34. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth, the unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy in both body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So what does that mean? Don't misunderstand what Paul is saying there when he talks about the things of the world. He doesn't mean carnality in worldly living. He means the things that go to, along with day-to-day -day life on earth. When you're single, you can fully give yourself to the Lord and to your career. Okay, so whatever it is that you do for a living or whatever it is that you want to pursue, if you're not married and you don't have a family, you have absolutely nothing hindering you from pursuing whatever you want to pursue career-wise. If you're married, the Bible says you got to pay attention to your spouse. And you got to pay attention to that day-to-day -to -day, that day -to -day because you do. Meals have to be cooked. Bills have to be paid. Trash got to be taken out. You got to have some love time. You got to have some alone time away from the kids. There's a lot you have to do. So what the Bible is teaching is that, remember I told you earlier about opportunity cost. The Bible is teaching that you've got to count up the cost. Because if you get married and you don't plan on paying any attention to your spouse, that marriage is going to dissolve. There's no way it can survive. You can't be married and not pay attention to your spouse. That's not going to fly. So if you're the, kind of, you're the kind of person and you know you want to give yourself fully to your career, go ahead on and do that. Don't even waste time getting married trying to get a spouse because it's not going to work because you have no desire to pay attention to them. On the flip, if you get married, you might have to give up some career aspirations just for your marriage. A lot of people do that, but you're going to have to make the choice. That's the point I'm trying to make here. So I'm not trying to beat you over the head with a right or wrong. I'm trying to give you the tools for an informed choice. So that when you make a choice, you understand what it is that it's going to cost you to make it work. Now let's look at another very interesting scripture, Deut Deuteronomy 24 and 5. Deuteronomy 24 and 5 says, If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. Look at that. So there's a principle that God gave the Israelites that we just don't follow in America. But we should follow it because it, it's really important. God says for the first year of your marriage, a man is supposed to be responsibility free so that he can be at home and, and be with his wife. That means there's some other scriptures I didn't read here that say he's, he's supposed to set his, uh, set his finances up with his brothers so that any responsibilities he might have his brothers can take it for him for that first year of his marriage. Mm -hmm. That's what we're supposed to do. So during that first year, we can focus on each other so we can get used to being married. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people get married on the run. They were in the middle of doing something, they got married, then they went back to what they were doing. That's why a lot of people say those first two years are so hard. That's because we don't do it the way the Lord said do it. That first year of marriage, man, you have to be free. You've got to have your mind free. You've got to have your finances free. So that y'all can get used to being married. That's the Bible way. Very few people do that. So we have what we call a honeymoon where we might go away for two days, three days, seven days, ten days. Then we come back to our lives and that's it. And then we wonder why that first year is so hard. That's not what God said. God said the whole year you ain't supposed to have nothing to do but be married. Did you know that? Did you know that the Bible teaches a year-long honeymoon? Did you know that? I know, psh, I know your brain just exploded because some of y'all never heard that <laughs> at any point in your life. But the Bible teaches a year-long honeymoon so that you are free at home so y'all can get used to being married and learn how to be happy together right there in the scripture. Because your wife's not going to be happy without any attention. Your wife's not going to be happy if she feels like she's second, third, fourth place in your life. She just won't be. Nobody gets married to feel like they're second place. Absolutely nobody. Okay? All right. So, what do we go over tonight? This is the third part of my No More Genies series on marriage. Because remember, we have to get away from the genie concept, all these magic concepts that we have, and see what the Bible actually says and see what life is actually like. So, tonight we talked about how you discern a spouse in the first place, number one. Number two, we talked about age, how age impacts marriage. We talked about communication, 
in the vetting process. We talked about finances, and we talked about career versus marriage. Okay? So those are some of the hurdles we have to overcome from a practical sense and from a scriptural perspective in getting and building a marriage. Okay? All right. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Anything you want me to pray for, about, or against. If you're fighting a spiritual fight, you're fighting against the devil, let me add my faith to yours. And together our faith will increase because two can put 10,000 to flight. So let me add my faith to yours. Anything you want prayer for, put it on the screen right now. I'll pray for it. Otherwise, I'm going to go and ask the Spirit about physical healing, casting out demons, finances, Whatever the Holy Ghost, whatever the Holy Ghost else has to say, okay? So when you see me close my eyes and pray in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost about those things I just mentioned to you. All right, things look pretty clear. Didn't really hear nothing from Spirit, so we're all good. So remember, I want you to like and share this video. You can watch a replay on Facebook Live, Periscope, or YouTube. And when you want to look me up online, I always hashtag everything I do with hashtag PDT. Hashtag PDT for Prophet David Taylor, okay? All right, so I hope that tonight was a blessing for you. God bless you. I hope that you're using the principles in this series to build a, bear, a better biblical marriage, okay? Because God is the one that invented marriage, so he's the one that will know how it works. Okay? So again, God bless you. I hope you have a good night. Uh, we've only got one more week left in March, and then we're in April already. Wow. Okay? So I hope that your marriages are, are becoming more godly, more fulfilling, and I hope they're reflecting the light of Christ in all that you say and do. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.